good job for Jesus. Children, praise the Lord. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 6, 17 this morning, rather. Praise the Lord. So thankful for his goodness. So thankful for the mercies of God. Be praying for our country. Be praying as different executive orders are signed that, that uh, broaden abortion and different things. Be praying that God will have mercy on our country and God will help us uh, to fight uh, for the unborn. Um, been very grieved this week uh, seeing some of the things that have been signed. Um, and uh, those babies, uh, they deserve a voice. They deserve somebody standing up for them. And it doesn't just need to be right before election time every four years. Um, so we are, we are praying and actively seeking God's face about how we can do more. Um, we are supporting um, that lighthouse um, in, there in that home in Warsaw and uh, looking for maybe more ways that we can uh, lead prayer efforts and join with other churches, um, even if they don't believe exactly like us. But uh, just help me pray about that. Um, and we definitely need, our country needs prayer so bad, so bad. God help us. God help us. Exodus 17 this morning, and I will try to be careful with time. It's one thing I've noticed editing uh, different videos of our last services. I need to be more careful. So Exodus 17 and verse number 8. I want to preach the Lord being our helper this morning on the blessing of burden sharing. The blessing of of burden sharing. Then came Amalek, Exodus 17 and 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand and Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, where he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Praise the Lord for his word. I, uh, this is a very, very familiar portion of scripture, as most are, I guess. But this one, especially so on pastor's appreciation uh, services. This, I even preached out of this portion of scripture in um, October in northern Ohio um, for a, a pastor appreciation service there. But as I read through it and as I really poured through those scriptures like I never have before, I really saw a wonderful um, prescription, if you will, for the Christian life. And we'll be going to the New Testament um, in a few moments, a few minutes, um, to review what Paul wrote to the church there. But this is a beautiful story of God's provision uh, and, and his using of men um, to help another man. Um, this was uh, a fight against the Amalekites. It was a flesh battle they were fighting, if you'll allow, allow me to say it that way, because the Amalekites in the Old Testament, they represent the flesh in those scriptures. They represent the flesh. They are descendants of Esau. We know Esau despised the birthright. We know that, that because of his despising of that birthright and selling that birthright for a pot of beans, uh, his inheritance, uh, that, that place as the firstborn he sold for a pot of beans. He despised it. It wasn't just 
the two-thirds share of what his father had. It was the spiritual share of what his father was giving to them. You understand that now, that, that God uh, 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 despised Esau, the Bible says. Uh, it, it says that he has turned away from him. Uh, he blessed him before his father's sake, but it says that he despised him. They were fighting against the flesh. All right. We know in ourselves that there is a daily war against the flesh. Uh, Paul said, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. Uh, I, I can't stand this. You know, Lord, help me. Uh, get me free from this body of death. And we all know, if we're honest with ourselves, that every day, uh, some days worse than others, there is a battle uh, against our flesh. Uh, we know we should read the Bible every day, that we should have a prayer time. Uh, but that's funny how sleep will come on you quick, even after you just woke up, if you're not careful. There is a battle in the flesh. These spiritual things, that it's, it's no big deal to sit down and watch something that we're, uh, that we're interested in for a couple hours. Uh, but to open up a YouTube page and to watch a sermon, uh, it, it almost seems like a bother at times. Because there's a battle in the flesh. The Israelites were fighting a flesh battle. They were fighting against the Amalekites. Not only was it a flesh battle, but it was their first battle. You understand that these men had lived in subservience to Egypt. They were the slaves of Egypt for for generations, there wasn't one person there that knew how, how really, how to head an army, how to do what Joshua was doing, except by God helping him. They, this was their very first time that they, as the children of Israel, as this group of the children of Israel, had engaged in warfare. We are fighting battles, even as a church, in, the, in this uh, society today, we are fighting battles that we've never faced before. These are firsts for us, all right? Unless somebody has lived uh, back to 1917 and 18, all right? This is a first for us. We are facing things that we've never seen before. Uh, th th these were unproven men fighting an unknown battle, fighting against unknown weaponry, fighting against unknown terrain. They were unproven, but, but God moved for them. So we know that because this was Israel's flesh battle and their first battle, that this also was Moses' flesh battle, and this was his first battle. All right, you stick with me here. I'm laying a foundation, but I believe God will help us this morning. It, it just so happened, we'll say it that way, they go out on an overlook as was common in that day and time for battles for the generals of the army to do. They went out on an overlook. They found a place where they could survey and they could send signals or send messengers to say, hey, do this or do that. And they went up there and Moses said, I'm going up with the rod of God in my hand, that same rod that he stretched over the Red Sea and God moved and caused it to fall back in heaps and they crossed over on dry land. He walks up to that hill and he sees, he realizes that his posture affects their performance. He realizes, I want you to put yourself, I know I do this all the time, but put yourself in Moses' shoes here this morning. He's up there on that hill. He sees the battle in array down on the ground before him. He probably can't see uh, the minute details, but he can see the, the ground gained and the ground lost. And as he raises his hands in a posture of prayer to God, a posture of petition unto God, he sees that they start winning the battle. They are, they're conquering more ground. And as his arms get tired and he lays them down, he sees instantly that, those, that ground that they gain, they start to fall back. And they're losing ground. They're losing ground. And he notices that. I don't know if he a couple times went, wait a minute, and raised his arms and he saw him and he put him back down. I doubt he was that flippant with it. Uh, I wonder if my analytical mind might have done that. Like, what are we doing here? Right? But, but he sees that ground gained and ground lost. And he realizes that the people that he was entrusted with uh, were falling when he let his arms down. See, he was a leader. The Bible says meek. He was a meek leader. He loved those folks. As frustrated and as uh, angry as he got with them, he loved them. 
And so when he let his arms down, he saw them fall. And he thought, oh God, oh God. It, he purposed in his heart, I believe, that he would do what it would take for them to win the battle. But we know with every battle that there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. There is a high price. And there is a high price for God's man to lead God's people. And today I won't be coming at you from that context. This isn't a pastor appreciation service. This is your pastor preaching to you. All right? But here's what I want to talk about. The, 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 that price that he was paying, two men saw firsthand the price that he was paying. They saw when he raised his arms. I don't know if y'all have ever done that. Me and Brother Brandon were here uh, hanging lights a, a while back. It's probably three years ago now. We're, and they were light. The, they were LED, those lights out there in the foyer. They were light. But, man, I remember it, when, when you get the sc a screw in the wrong place and you measure, oh, we got to move it over. You remember that last light we hung? That we move it over. So we move it, and your hands are up for a while. It doesn't matter how heavy something is. When, when you're at a, standing at a strain for a little while, that those hands get heavy. They get, they get hard. Our, our, our basketball coach, we would do circuits, and he would have us do something for four minutes in a row, and then we would switch. So you do push-ups. You couldn't rest your chest on the ground for four minutes. That was akin to torture. I tell you, it doesn't sound that bad, but try it when you get home today. Just four minutes of nothing but push-ups. It burns. He had us, the, the, my least favorite uh, uh, station at that, not running the bleachers, not doing sit-ups for four minutes or push-ups. My least favorite was the chest pass against the wall. We would do chest passes for four minutes straight. And man, the pain that would end up going through my, my forearms and my hands, just chest pass. And if he caught you taking a breather, you, you had to do it a little bit longer. So nobody wanted to take a breather. That sustained motion, doing it over and over again, as hard as you could against the wall that pain that would burn through your arms. I imagine as Moses is holding up that rod that wasn't too heavy, it's just a, a rod, a stick, but he's holding it up and those men that are standing around him, they're watching his arms and he's talking to them. Guys, if I let this down, we're going to lose ground. Guys, I'm, I'm, my hands are shaking. What am I going to do? I want to preach this morning about the blessing of being a burden sharer. Uh, someone, someone that shares the burden with somebody that they see is struggling this morning. God help us this morning that the dy dynamic duo of Aaron and her come to the rescue and they see uh, they see that Moses has a burden. They share in that burden. And because they shared in that burden, they shared in Moses' victory. He gets a lot of the credit, but they shared in it with him. Uh, here, here's the first thing that you need to do to be a burden share. Verse number 12 of our text this morning, the Bible says Moses' hands were heavy. Moses' hands were heavy. You have to see the weakness in somebody else's life. You have to acknowledge that they have a need in their life. Uh, there, there is a need in churches. Now understand, I'm going to try to be very careful with my words this morning. There is a need in churches for people that can see others' weaknesses. Caveat right here, all right? Not to criticize and not to tear down, you understand. Not to see the weakness for sake of seeing the weakness, but to see the weakness so we can step in and help support the weakness. Uh, there was... Lord, help me this morning. There was a, a, a young mother uh, at a church that we ministered at, and she had four children, and she was by herself. Her husband was a drug dealer uh, and, and, and different other things that happened throughout that, and she was on her own raising those kids. And as a youth pastor in that church, I saw a need there, and I tried to step in and fulfill the need as much as I could a uh, little bit difficult circumstances, but I watched her brother come in. I watched her brother come in, and he loved the Lord, and he was zealous for the Lord, and he moved into that area, and I watched him step into a role that he didn't have to take, but he saw a need in her life. 
And I saw the beautiful thing happening as, as he took on that pseudo father role in her children's life. And he would help them. He would encourage them. He would discipline them as was needed. But he stepped in and he fulfilled a need. Why was he able to do that? Because he saw behind the scenes the weakness that, had, that was taking place. The, the exhaustion in that poor mama's life, working a full-time job and trying to raise four kids. Oh, uh, th this doesn't mean that you see the need so you can criticize. There were other people in the church that were fulfilling that portion of it. But no, you, step, you see the need so you can step in and be a Christian. I preached last week about the Good Samaritan and how it's time to do some good. It's not uh, always time to criticize the bad, but, but the best people that you can see are the people that see what's going wrong in an area or the world and they say you know what I might not be able to fix the whole circumstance but I can step in and I can fulfill the need they acknowledge the need this means uh, you can acknowledge hey there are needs in other people's life you know what that takes it takes looking past your own needs sometimes to see the needs of others God help us. You can acknowledge even in my in myself as the pastor at this church that I have weaknesses and I have needs. But there is something so blessed about people. And I praise the Lord for the good people here at Mount Zion Tabernacle. I'm thankful for you that will come in and support the need in my life. But it doesn't stop with your pastor. We can look around the congregation and see that there are needs. There are places that people need to step into and support the need. When you acknowledge that there is a need, you will be in a better position to help. Huh? Sometimes the weakness is something that somebody else isn't good at. And they don't need your criticism for it. Unless, I guess unless it's constructive. But sometimes they need people to step in and say, hey, I'll help you with that. Oh, it, it might be something that others don't have time with for, but you do. You can step in and help. Not only we, do we need to step in and see the weakness, but we need to sense the weariness. This will help on how um, you feel towards others. When you can see or sense the weariness. Verse number 12 it says, After they saw that his arms grew heavy, it says they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down. See, they were attentive to his necessities. I, I don't see Moses asking, but they saw the weakness in his hands. They sensed the weariness in his body, and they acted accordingly. There is, there is something, and I say this often, and I heard Jensen Franklin say it one time, and it convicted me and convinced me all at the same time. But, but there, there is the most valuable people in your life are the ones that give often and rarely take. Sometimes we need to do better about receiving help. I understand that. But, but there is something valuable to you in your life and people that, that give often. I was in a, in a car riding down the road with a pastor a long time ago probably 12 or 15 years ago now, and, and he got a phone call. And in a moment, a rare moment of transparency, he was not a man that was often like this. He saw who was calling, and he groaned out loud. He groaned. He goes, oh, the only time he ever calls me is when he needs something. And he just put the, he put the phone down, didn't answer it. At that moment, I, I laughed at the moment because that was so out of character for the person that I was riding with. I found out later when we stopped, got off the road, he called back and that man sure enough had somebody that needed, he needed picked up from an airport about an hour away and driven and meet, to meet him. And, and he, he uh, I believe he went ahead and did that for him. But, but there, is, there was something about that that just stuck out to me. In, in our own life, see, we can be so attentive to our own needs. We can be so attentive to our own weariness. And I'm talking about myself here. I'm going to install a mirror on the back wall someday so I can preach to myself. I'll get too distracted. But uh, anyway, uh, the, you know, sometimes we get so absorbed in our own needs 
that will, that will miss out on opportunities for ministry. We'll miss out on opportunities for ministry. The most, uh, the most valuable people in your life are the ones who often give and rarely take. See, there are things that can be done by others. Uh, there was things there that they could help with. They couldn't hold the rod of God up themselves because that wasn't their position. That rod and that power wasn't given to them. But they could support the weight of his arms. They could find a rock to roll up under him. I imagine it was a large rock where he could be seated at least a little bit more comfortably than standing like this for 14 hours of the sunlight that day. Uh, they rolled it up. They got to work and they placed it under him because they sensed the weariness. They sensed the weariness in his life. Uh, support number three, verse number 12. The Bible says Aaron and her stayed up his hands. Uh, they supported the weight. They supported the weight in his life. They anticipated the heaviness that was coming. After the Apostle Paul offered some constructive criticism, I guess, of the church at Corinth, and right after some more criticism that, that, that was really just straight to the point, he says this to them. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. He said, I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. That church, if you read through that, do a Bible study, he's, he is answering questions that they wrote to him. Uh, hey, what do you think about this? And he's, he, when you read through it, if you, if you kind of move it to the context of, of nowadays in your own life and all these different ways of looking at it, you look at it, it's kind of comical. All the questions he's, of course not, that's not okay. What are y'all thinking? You know, what, like, of course that's not okay. Stop that. Stop that. He, after all that, it, it shows that that church was a weight to the Apostle Paul. It was a heavy weight on his shoulders. But he, he wanted them to know, thank you for doing so much for me. Thank you for doing so much for me. And he wanted them to do right in their lives. Aaron and her had seen at the start of the chapter that we didn't read that that this that this nation Israel had chided Moses and murmured against him. See, sometimes sometimes you see that need that's in somebody not because of any result of their own but because of what they're going through being torn down from the stressors from that that pressure from without that comes against people. When you keep your eyes open for that thing, again, not to tear down people, but to help build up people. Just because a, a miraculous fountain of water had flowed from the rock, it didn't take the pressure off of Moses. They had seen a great battle, a, a great victory won with the water flowing from the rock, but then they get to this place and it's just another day uh, in the office of the wilderness. Just another battle that they have to face. I imagine Moses as he saw that be uh, that battle become an array, he, he thought, not again. We just got through something. Can I have a week off, Lord? You know, can I get through this, Lord, before something else? But it came again and and so those men saw all the things that, that he was going through they saw the grand scape of what he was going through and they supported the weight they supported the weight there are brothers and sisters among us today that even I I'm probably more privy to more information than some of the rest of us are but even I don't know about what people are going through to the to the extent of what they are going through and, and, and there are, there's one thing that's true. Moses learned it. He tried to handle all the administration of, of the nation. He tried to handle all that, and it wasn't working. And his father-in-law comes in and says, listen, you're trying to do too much. You need to appoint this and that. There, there needs to be a, a multiplicity, rather, of elders that, that will help you. Uh, judge the nation and for the very worst you can help Moses learned this that he couldn't handle it in himself he couldn't handle it by himself and 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 as we look around and see different 
families and different needs. There are times that we can't handle it ourselves. We can't. And I know, oh, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Some spiritual, well-meaning person, oh, just give it to God. Easy for you to say you're not going through it, right? But then secondly, we know that God in his word tells us, bear ye one another's burdens. Huh? Bear ye. I know in that same chapter, Galatians uh, 6, I believe, don't quote me, uh, but Galatians 6, bear ye one another's burdens, ver verse number 2, and verse number 5, it tells us to bear our own burdens. But there are some things that come into our life that we can't carry ourselves. Praise God for the family of God. I got a text this morning uh, uh, from somebody, and he, and he said, oh, I'm so, I'm from a big family, but I'm so thankful for my church family. I feel such a support from my church family that's what it means and you'll never know how far a text will go you'll never know how far a little card will go for somebody that's going through something in their life it might take you 10 seconds to let them know hey I prayed for you today I know you're struggling right now or I sense that you're struggling right now try to uh, uh, gild it up a little bit you're doing well you're doing well but I'm just praying for you you'll never know how far that will go in somebody's life. We need to be those good Samaritans in, in people's lives that are broken and bleeding. They're facing trial after trial. Look around this room. Look around our county here, our little towns. There are people that are hurting. There are people that are bleeding and broken. But praise God, we have the solution. We have the oil of the Spirit that we can carry to people and we can pour in that wine. We can can take them the blood of Jesus Christ and extend it to them there is help if you're going through something today don't feel like you're by yourself Jesus Christ gave you a church family to lift you up in prayer to support you in your weakness don't be too proud to accept the help they supported the weight they supported it Here, here's something that that I really felt in prayer that, that we should really focus on. Verse number 12, it says that they stayed up his hands. They took the stone. They saw that his hands were heavy. They took the stone and rolled it under him. And, and then they stayed up his hands. And then all this is in verse number 12, a nice clean four-point outline, praise the Lord, for my OCD mind. And they stayed until the battle was over. They stayed they stayed, praise God, until the going down of the sun. I want to encourage you. It will take uh, intestinal fortitude or guts, as we say, right? It'll take some strength in ourselves because sometimes people will weary you. People that you're trying to help, they will weary you. But I, I, I pray that you'll attach yourself Till the finish. Uh, I, I pray that you'll ask God, where can I be of assistance to somebody? Where can I see a need? God, help me to see the need and fill in the place there. Uh, they were there until it was over. Can I encourage you in the church? And can I encourage you in your relationships? If God doesn't call you to leave, stay and stay well you hear me stay and stay well all right people are leaving and hear me today they're leaving churches that have accountability and finding churches that offer an anonymity it, it might not happen here as much because there, there's not a whole lot of mega churches around here but but there is something that's going on and when you're unknown you can slip through the cracks. When you're unknown in a church or in a body of believers, people don't know. People don't know what you're going through. They don't even know if you're at church that morning in some places. I've seen it. I just want to go somewhere and sit. I've heard that so many times, counseling people on the phone over the last probably three years in different places of the country. I just want to go somewhere and sit. I'm tired. I, I've been used and abused. Can I tell you, 
Can I tell you that God is desiring people that will stand and fight? Hear me today. It, it, we are, we are, it's not just because of this whole last year. We are in the last days, all right? If, if in last January we were still saying the same thing, we are living in the end of days. We are living in that time where I believe Jesus is going to come back. And in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, I don't know the day or the hour. The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. All right. But here's what I know, that the signs of the times are everywhere. God desires you. He, he warned us about this in time. He warned us that there would come a great falling away, that there would come. There would be a time when if, if the very elect could be deceived, they would be. If they could, they would be. It, we are living in a, in a day where the great falling away happens. We are living in that time. And I, I want to caution you first, but encourage you second, that we need to stand. There is nothing more important in your life than your relationship with Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important than striving to live by this book. Don't, don't get weary in well-doing. Don't fall away and miss it right at the finish line. He's coming back soon. And he is coming back for a church that is without spot or blemish. We need to stay till the whole battle is over. Can you imagine if Aaron and her at the nearing of the dusk, well, if the sun's about going down. They're probably going to end this up. Moses, you're on your own. His little, I don't know if you've ever been in an altar call where you've had your hands up for a long time, but the numbness starts there and it starts working working your way down. Huh? He's holding something. It's worse than that. And, and oh, Moses, you can handle it yourself. You got a stone to sit on. We're going to go get some dinner. You want something? We're going to Chick-fil-A, right? And no, he, he's by himself up there if they do that. They stayed until the battle was over. Praise God. You know what? Moses is the leader. Moses gets the pat on the backs. Moses gets, wow, what a great meek leader you are, Moses. But there was two men that were hiding in his shadow that were supporting him up. Praise God if you can support somebody so they can make it to heaven. Praise God if you can lift somebody's arms up in their weak time, in their moment of struggle and battle that they're facing. You're... you're church family, your loved ones, they need somebody that will fight for their soul. Praise God. My children, my children, I got one nearing uh, being a teenager this year. God help us. I, I, there, there is coming a day, and it's probably already here, that they need the support of your prayers as a church family. Huh? Why? Because we're part of the family of God. I, I, not just me and Amanda, but my kids. Uh, not just, not just the, the patriarch and matriarch of your family, but all of them. They need that covering of prayer. In this time, I'm seeing so many folks. I, I read an article by uh, uh, the pastor there. I have his, uh, his study Bible in there. I, MacArthur, maybe, in California. And Grace Community, he stood uh, this year. He was he was a brave man, and I applaud him. But he said that there, there, there's people falling away. There's charlatans that that are are falling away uh, from the faith right now. They're caught up in in moral failures. They're caught up in in all this different trash, trying to take as much money as they can so they can get a a second jet. All this stupid stuff that's going on in the Christian, quote unquote, Christian church in America. Can I tell you that now is the time to fight? It's not time to to try to pay up uh, uh, zeros in your bank account as a Christian ministry. It's not time to do anything else but get the end in view. Get the finish line in view. I have pressed towards the mark. Paul said we've got to be a church. We've got to be a, a capital C church as a whole that presses towards the mark of our high calling and stays until the battle is over. Hold on. Hold on, no matter how bumpy and wavy it gets, hold on. Help one another. No matter how, uh, I imagine Moses was sweating. 
He was stinking. He was going through all the things that go through in the, in, those, uh, mid, in the Middle East over there, the heat, all that different stuff was going on. But they stayed with him till the battle was over. Stay, stay till the battle is over. I wanted to read this to you, man, if you could come. This, I've already quoted this. But the first verse of that chapter of Galatians 6, it says this, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Huh? And then it goes into those verses that I quoted earlier, bear ye one another's burdens. That, that the, the context there, those verses, but right up against each other. If you see someone taking overtaken in a fault huh then he says bear ye one another's burdens you know that word burden in the original there it's it's baros it means something heavy or fault bear ye one another's faults huh? we don't like hearing that stuff huh bear ye one another's heaviness god is calling us as a church to bind together there in my home church growing up, they used to sing Brother, Brother uh, Gerald Hood, my pastor. He would sing uh, that old song, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords, with heavenly cords of love or something like that. It's been a long time, y'all. I'm sorry. But man, that, that, that binding that can come, a threefold cord isn't easily broken that this church we're, we're little we've got a decent sized crowd for us here today at least since COVID hit but you know there, there's something that we can do we can bear one another's burdens I know we got masks on half the time it seems like we can't read people's expressions we can see their eyes but we can't see if they're frowning at us or or sticking their tongue out at us or whatever but but here's what we got we we got the love of Christ living in us. We can reach out. We can see needs of people. I don't know why uh, the last two Sunday mornings I felt driven to preach this way. But God wants us to love one another. God wants us to carry one another's burdens. Huh? He, he said, you can come into the yoke with me for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. But he still said, bear ye one another's burdens. Stand with me if you will. There's a blessing in being a burden sharer. Hear me this morning. There's a blessing for people that reach out and carry others' burdens. That, 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 uh, that offering that we announced earlier, I don't want to just give it a name right now, but that offering that we announced earlier, that's a way we can bear one another's burdens. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to start a, a, a We Care committee, finally. I, st I got ready to start it last January and, uh, and with all this that's going on. But there's ways that we can bear one another's burdens. I, I pray, I, I ask you this morning. I know, I know oftentimes we want, I want, my flesh wants to preach something that will lead people happy and shouting, standing on their feet, pumping their fist, whatever it is. But, but there are times that, that we need, we need to really get down to what Christianity really is. Christianity is thinking of ourselves less and thinking of others more. Thinking of ourselves less and thinking of others more. God, give us the grace and the humility to do it. Lord, I love you. Thankful for you. Thank you, God, for your word. I pray, God, that you will encourage and strengthen our church, God, as we endeavor, as we press towards that mark of living the life that you have asked us to live. God, I pray, Lord, that you move. Those that are hurting, God, this morning, I pray that they'll feel the prayers of their brothers and sisters. Those, God, that are maybe uh, reaching out to you right now, thinking of others that have needs. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll guide them and direct them to exactly what and who they should be helping, Lord. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. These altars are open.
Won't you find a place to pray this morning? Talk to the Lord. Meditate on His Word. Ask Him to strengthen you and to help you. You don't have to be. Bear-